Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee with Craig, where we talk about all things firearms, firearms policy, politics, culture, media, you name it. We're talking about it right here on Coffee with Craig. So please take a moment to like and share the program so that your friends can join in the conversation as it's happening. Remember, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow us on Facebook. Make sure you hit the notification button because, well, Facebook has marked our videos as explicit meaning they don't want you to hear what we're talking about. So I know you want to hear. So if you want to hear when it's happening, make sure that you hit that notification button. Also, please make it a point to go to fpcgear.com. That's fpcgear.com. It's a cool place to go to find all sorts of pro 2A swag, T-shirts, coffee mugs, hoodies, you name it. Uh, but the cool thing is, is that every dollar that you spend there goes right back into the fight for our right to keep and bear arms. So you can support the Second Amendment, and you can look good doing it. That's fpcgear.com. All right, let's get to today's topic. Now, we all know that, uh, well, universal uh, background checks actually recently passed uh, the House of Representatives, uh, which basically means their whole goal is to make sure that there is a quote-unquote background check or as I like to call it, uh, a back-end registry uh, for all firearm transfers and all firearm purchases. Well, there was a study, uh, or at least a, 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 a piece that was recently put out, featuring a guy that I think you guys all know pretty well, Mr. John Lott. Now, John Lott is the preeminent uh, researcher when it comes to pro, when it comes to the Second Amendment, and helping people to understand, or at least helping to debunk a lot of the the the, the trash that comes out of the anti-gun anti-gun research organizations. And one of the things that he that he wanted to talk about, or that he was talking about in this particular interview, relating to the Second Amendment, um, I mean, relating to this issue, uh, had to do with background checks and its impact on minorities. So here, I want you guys to to check this out real quick. For background checks generally, uh, what you have to do is you have to fill out the form to buy a gun. It's called 4473. You put your name your social security number, your address, your race, your birthday, your eye color. You know, you give them all this information, you think they're using all that information. But what they've ended up using is phonetic, roughly phonetically similar names. So somebody who may be John Smith, well, a Smith with a Y and an E and a Smith with an I, as far as the government's concerned, those are roughly phonetically similar names and it's the same person, same name that's there. And then they'll look at birthdays, and many times they'll even look at, quote, similar birthdays. So if it's the same month and year, but it's an eight rather than a three or something like that, they'll consider those similar types of birthdays that are there. And the problem is, is that when you have, uh, you know, similar names or similar birthdays, you're going to get a lot of people who just are, have similar information to a felon. Let's say who you really want to stop from being able to go and obtain a gun. And the problem is, is that you end up, unfortunately, stopping a lot of law-abiding citizens who may really need a gun to protect themselves and their families. If a private company was able to go and just use the small amount of information, or you know, rough information, roughly phonetically similar names, or similar birthdays, or things like that, Democrats would scream bloody murder because, and they would tell you, the reason is they're worried that it would harm minorities. Well, if it creates a problem there, why aren't we concerned about minorities being able to defend themselves and their families? So three, you said three million false, false positives. What happens if you um, end up on the wrong side of the, of the background check? And you can't get a gun, and you're 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 legal, and you really want that that gun f to protect your family. You know, maybe you live in a rough neighborhood. What what right. happens? How do you get out of that box? Well, you can appeal, but the problem is the vast majority of people who try to go and appeal are going to have to hire a lawyer, and lawyers will charge anything from like three thousand to ten thousand dollars to go through this process. What they're doing is they're not only primarily stopping minorities, but they're stopping middle income and poor minorities primarily from being able to go and get guns. You know so that's kind of the argument. And, uh, 
you know, I I wanted to have I want to have a good friend a, a good friend of mine on to talk a little bit about this now uh, because you know ultimately and I always say this it, this is about civil rights and and we've been fighting. Uh, we're always talking about the importance of civil rights in, in our community. Groups like the NAACP, ACLU, the Urban League are always talking about fighting for our rights. But for some reason, they seem to keep forgetting about this particular fundamental right. So uh, I want to have a good friend of mine, Mr. Rick Ector. Uh, Rick, uh, Rick is from an organization known as, uh, well, it's Legally Armed in Detroit. So I will let Rick tell you what the acronym is. Rick, how you doing? Hey, man, I am great. First and foremost, I want to thank you for having me on the show, man. It was great making your acquaintance a few years back at the conferences, particularly at the Gun Rights Policy Conference, the GRPC. And uh, we finally got it together where our schedules matched up, man. And I am so gracious and honest and, and happy to be on your show. But yes, the name of my organization is Legally Armed in Detroit. It's a nice phrase I came up with that adequately describes what we do in Detroit. And of course, if you take the first letter of those words, it is LAID, L-A-I-D, Legally Armed in Detroit. It uh, is very useful to jog people's memories when they want mm -hmm. to uh, find me on the internet. They say, hey, what was that guy's website? What was his blog? And they're like, yeah, LAID, Legally Armed in Detroit. So uh, if anyone out there wants to know what we're doing here in the metro Detroit area in the state of Michigan, feel free to give me a visit on the World Wide Web at LegallyArmedInDetroit.com. All right. So you, 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 you're familiar with the issue. Now, first of all, do me a favor. Just give folks a little bit about your, 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 your bona fide so people can understand exactly uh, who you are. Uh, who I am. I am currently uh, owner of Legally Armed in Detroit, Rick's Firearm Academy in Detroit. I do a, a service to people who have a desire to take one or more active role in their personal protection. I got into this field approximately 13, 14 years ago. Just real brief about how I got into this uh, field, this industry. I was probably the most unassuming uh, I wouldn't say anti-gun person, but the whole gun ownership thing was really not on my radar. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until I had a rude awakening one day. I was coming home from work, and it was during the time of the year when it gets dark early, maybe 6 o'clock in the evening, uh, local time. And I was robbed at gunpoint in my own driveway. And so that really started me to start thinking and questioning my position about guns and the right to keep and bear arms and getting a concealed carry license. And so I did some investigation and I decided that I would get a carry license, a carry permit. We call them CPLs, concealed pistol licenses here in Michigan. And uh, it, it's been a road I've been on and I learned all I could about caring and self-defense. And then I started taking an interest in helping my fellow citizens, men and women of Metro Detroit, who have a desire to take on a more active role in their protection. And I, I haven't looked back and I continued my training and development. And I decided to become a National Rifle Association Credential Firearms Instructor. And I continued down that path. And I am now also a training counselor. So if there's anyone in the area who wishes to become a firearms instructor, I train people how to be a, a firearms trainer to train other people to get their carry permits. And somewhere along the line, I met a guy by the name of Ken Blanchard. If any of your readers or listeners are familiar with him, he runs a blog pod podcast that's uh, entitled Black Man with a Gun. And I've had a chance to befriend Ken and, and learn a lot of things that he's doing. And that got me interested in gun rights uh, as a advocacy uh, activity. And I engage in a lot of pro-gun activities here in Metro Detroit. Probably my signature event that I do here in Metro Detroit is every year I run a free training event for any woman who is interested in learning more about guns and personal protection and self-defense. All they have to do is show up at the gun range that we're running the event. We will provide them free access to a gun, ammunition, 
one-on-one -on -one, uh, supervision and instruction with an instructor. We'll pay all the expenses and we'll have them shoot a gun at a gun range free of charge. And it has grown from, uh, what was it, like 50 women the first year we did it seven years ago. And this last uh, year, this previous uh, May, we trained 700 women and we're looking to do anywhere from 800 to 1,000 women with the free training lesson uh, this upcoming May. So I'm very familiar with gun rights advocacy and bringing it out to underserved communities, particularly women. And I'm not sure if we're going to jump into the local area here, but it's pretty bad, dangerous here in mm -hmm. the metro Detroit. There's a lot of crime, and I'm always advocating for people to take on a more active role in their personal protection. Well, you know, and I I, I appreciate all that. Cause see, I I wanted people to know that I, you know I I didn't just pull a brother off the street to <laughs> to talk about this particular topic. Um, cause you know, so number one, you were someone who you know. Wasn't necessarily anti-gun, but you weren't an advocate for for personal self-defense in the Second Amendment, um, and you made it a point to number one, become responsible for your own self-defense. Then number two, you wanted to help other people to become responsible for their for their for their own personal self-defense, and then in that you recognized that there were policies that were being implemented or were in place. That was hindering that, and then you became an advocate. Yes, and, and, that, and that is really the progression that I undertook. One, I realized that I am ultimately responsible for my safety, and there's nothing like two thugs shoving a gun in your face. To learn to teach you that, huh? <laughs> to, to rescue you like they do in the movies. And so once I took on that role of being my own first responder, and then I wanted to learn so much, and then I wanted to help other people in my community do the same thing. And then I realized of the people that I was training, there was a lack of women who were uh, getting involved. And, and the one event that I saw in the news media, man, it was a, it was a really distressing story. It was about a woman's body that was found just discarded in the street you know, without so much as an afterthought in the aftermath of the violent crime that had been committed against her, that I thought, man, someone should do something about that. And then as I kept thinking, I was like, well, hey, guess what? I am I someone. I can do so something. So what can I do? Well, it, it, and, that, and that's the thing. So first and foremost, folks, just realize, look, you there is a place for you to be involved in this in, to be involved in this fight and unfortunately in states like Michigan and in states like California it is a fight um and when you look at even nationally where now we have you know uh, HR8 has passed at the federal level so now we now we're looking at federal background ch checks or at least we're not looking at it yet it's still got to get through the house and and then and then pass president Trump before before it becomes law but these are the things that that, that we're talking about so all right, so what's your perspective on on universal background checks? Um, you know, in, in general, I am not an advocate for more gun control, you know, whether it's these so-called universal background checks. In my personal opinion, we have over, what what is it, like 20,000 gun laws on the books, and they're always are, are threatening additional laws and regulation. It's hard enough to convince people in, in some of our, urban and and people of color dominated communities to even take on you know active role in their personal protection and then they keep they keep thinking about enacting more and more laws while at the same time the supreme court has ruled years ago that law enforcement is not responsible for your safety that that duty is your job it's your job to be safe and then when you look at the laws and the schemes that you know our local you know, government officials are, are trying to implement, it's all designed to disarm us and it's designed to make us even more likely to be victims of crime, while at the same time, they're totally absolved of any responsibility of ensuring that we're safe. So well, it, it, you know, it, it, exactly. If I, if I just cut you off here real quick, one of the things, and there's a, a multitude of things dealing with universal background checks that are the problem. Like, they want to talk about the, the mass shootings, Yet in, in a number of the cases, 
Uh, background checks, either background checks were done and the person got the gun, still got the gun and they shouldn't have. Uh, it, it, it would, or they got the firearm illegally, which meant, guess what? They wouldn't have had to go through a background check. In fact, over 90% of the time when they find a gun that's been used in a crime, it, it, it's not in the possession of the actual owner of the firearm, meaning the, that no background check played a role in them obtaining the firearm. It does absolutely nothing, in other words, to reduce well, crime. That's the thing. You know, you can put another 20,000 gun laws on the books, and it's only going to affect those individuals who are law-abiding and, by definition, who obey the law. Criminals, whether they're rapists, whether they are assaulters, whether they are people who have a, a, an issue in which they have no problem with offering violence to their fellow citizens, laws have absolutely no effect on, on that behavior. It's only the law abiding who are going to obey the law. And, you know, as advocates of, of responsibility, of personal protection, of, of people taking on a more active role in their safety, since the Supreme Court has ruled it's not the role of the government to protect you, right. then I think that they should uh, engage in activities that makes it easier for us to do that. And, and so, like I said, the fire has been lit under me several years ago when I had a gun shoved in my face in my own driveway. And I see all gun control as, as not contributing to our safety. And it all should be abolished because good people are going to be good and bad people are just going to do evil things. Yes. Yes, they are. And, you know, and now there's the other aspect of of background checks, in particular the way in which they're implemented. You know, I've always wondered if this is not supposed to be a registry, then why do they need the make, model, and serial number of the firearm for which I am doing a background check? I always thought, okay, if you're going to do a background check, here's how it ought to work. It's, I give you my, I give you my information. You check the list of people who aren't supposed to own guns. We're talking felons and people who've been commit, convicted of domestic violence and, and people who've been deemed mentally ill. Uh, or mentally, you know, mentally unfit to own a firearm, whatever, however that is, if my name's not on that list, then give me my gun. Well, and you're hitting on a very, a very big point. And the whole issue is, if you really look at it, the sole purpose of registration is just to create a shopping list for the, for the anti-civil rights crowd such that if they ever do pass a law that outlaws individual ownership of guns they have a handy shopping list to go down into our communities house by house and confiscate all the lawfully owned firearms so really there's no reason to maintain this registry whatsoever but you know that that's what they do man they they keep fighting to take away our rights and then they're also documenting who we are where we live and what we own so that once they feel that they're successful that they can come and take our guns well, you know, and, and, I'll, and I'll take it uh, to, to a whole different level. You know, in places where they're, where it is highly restrictive to legally be able to get a gun, uh, places where you have to get, for example, a, a, a permit to even buy a gun, my question and what I always wonder is, well, if, it's, if a person wants a gun and needs a gun, they're going to go get a gun. And so if you're talking about areas like Detroit – or Chicago, or San Francisco, or places where it's really where where the laws are highly restrictive. Um, I don't think that if someone really feels like, first of all, the criminals are going to go, they're going to go get a gun any which way they can. They they're not going to bother following the law. But in many cases, you're going to have law-abiding citizens who are going to say, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to get a gun. I'm going to have a gun. And uh, you know, if I wind up ever having to use it, well, I'd rather be. Judged by 12, then carried by six. Yeah, that's, that's a sentiment that you hear a lot of people say. One, one thing that I do want to share with you and your listeners is that uh, in the state of Michigan, we went to a, a style of licensing called shell issue uh, a number of years ago. It's probably close to 20 years now, where as long as a citizen can pass a background check uh, and and takes a, a qualified training course, they will get a license on a shell issue basis. This is something that is uh, really but that that's rare. that that's for conceal carry conceal carry right right, right okay right. yeah and it, it's something that's really rare because one of the things that if you look at the history of gun control is that 
guns are highly regulated, especially in areas in which people of color are concentrated. So when you have your major cities, mm -hmm. you know, such like the big cities in, in California, like Los Angeles and San Diego and, and places all throughout that state, or if you go somewhere like Chicago, they're highly restricted and regulated. Or if you go to places like New Jersey, you know, all throughout that state or New York, New York state, uh, they do have concealed carry permits, but you know what? If you're not connected or if you're not famous, some movie star or some important person is deemed by the local government, you know, leadership, you're not going to get one. So exactly. You know, exactly. That's one of the really think one of the really great things that we like about Shell Issue, man, mm -hmm. is that it at least levels the playing field. And exactly. If you're a person who can pass a background check and you get some training. Hey, you can get a permit here, at least in the state of Michigan, to carry concealed. Or if you're sufficiently emboldened and, and you're, you're OK with it, mm -hmm. you know, here in Michigan, you can also open carry. You know, mm -hmm. there's some some <laughs> issues with that right. and, and whether they're cultural or additional regulations that you'll make sure that you don't have to run afoul of. But it all starts with education and with training and then. Finding a peer group mm -hmm. of people in the community who will uh, ease you in into the lifestyle such that you can sufficiently do it without right. uh, having any concerns about running afoul of any law. So right. it's great. Right. So, hey, uh, before I let you go, let folks know uh, how they can uh, get a hold of you or follow the work, uh, the work that you're doing there in, in Detroit. Man, um, first and foremost, let me just say it, it's been great to, to be on your show and to talk with your listening audience of people who want to uh, get in touch with me. I, I am very active in social media. You know, my tag or my ID in social media is Detroit CTW, and you can catch me whether we're talking about Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, any major social media uh venue or place is usually Detroit CCW. Uh, my flagship blog is legallyarmedindetroit.com or you can meet me, reach me at my website at DetroitCCW.com. Always glad to see you, Craig. Hopefully we'll see you again at, at the GRPC this year. I'm not sure if you go to the NRA meetings, but I'm looking forward to to making it to the NRA annual meeting this year, assuming, you know, everything goes according to plan, man. But it's always great seeing you and talking with you. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure talking with you, sir. And uh, hopefully I will get a chance to see you uh, at NRA and at GRPC. Everyone, Mr. Rick Ector with Legally Armed in Detroit. Brothers getting laid. <laughs> you know I had to say that. Holla at yeah, you later, no, bro. I, that way you won't forget. You won't forget. Go, all right, sir. All right. All right, everybody. Well, hey, that's going to be it for today's uh, episode of Coffee with Craig. We very much appreciate you guys tuning in. We appreciate you guys liking and sharing the program and telling your friends about the Firearms Policy Coalition. We are the home in the fight for civil rights. Got to use them or you're going to lose them. You guys take care. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.